Hey, thanks for joining us here at Faith Online. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about who we are as a church and how you can stay connected, head over to faithishere.org right after this video. Welcome this morning. Aren't you glad you live in America? What a great land to live in. We've got problems, got stuff going on, stuff we don't totally understand. Nutty things happen all around us, even this last week. But I'm so thankful I live in America. Great land that was found on religious principles, religious freedom. Uh, part of our Constitution is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are fundamental rights that we have. And in America, and I'm thankful we can live there and exercise those freedoms we have today. But I will tell you, those freedoms are more and more coming under attack. The enemy wants to silence our voice, silence our witness. The enemy wants the church to be quiet. And it may happen through legislation. It may happen through persecution. It may happen through others that will come against us and try to stop the spread of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm here to tell you, the gospel is unstoppable, and it will go forth. It will go forth. We started our series last week. We talked about raising the standard. And, and, and our kind of the theme we're, we're centering around is Jesus Christ's own words. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And so regardless of what we might be told to do or our voice might be tried to be silent or attempt to be silent, we're going to keep lifting up the name of Jesus Christ here and in our land and all around, not just in the church, but wherever we go, we're going to raise high the standard and lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to stand with me as we look at God's word today, and uh, we're going to go with Psalm chapter 2, Psalm 2 this morning, and we'll start with the first three verses and work our way through this chapter a little bit later. Psalm chapter 2 and verse number 1. Why do the nations conspire? Why do the people plot in vain? Now, he talks about a coming together of the nations and a plotting. Let's see what he's talking about. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord. There is a plot there is enemies. There are nations that will come together and stand against the Lord. Verse 3, and, and, and against his holy one. Verse 3, let us break their chains, they say, and let us throw off our fetters. In other words, no one's going to tell us what to do. We're not going to come under the rule and authority of Almighty God. We're going to do exactly what we want to. We're going to throw off all of our fetters. Why do the nations do this? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your sweet presence here today. We thank you, God, for America. And I thank you for the body of Christ. And I pray the body of Christ in this hour will be strengthened, Lord Jesus, that we will let our voices be heard, uh, that we will speak out for you, that we'll raise the standard very high in this generation in which we live. America needs the Lord. So may we be that voice, I pray, to declaim your glory and, and your presence and your power. And we ask all this in your holy, mighty name. Amen and amen. Turn to someone, tell them to try to keep cool out there, and then you may be seated. A recent report just came out of the nation of Syria. I want to share some of that with you this morning. Uh, Syria has been at civil war for the last five years. It's been going on crazy over there. An estimated 400,000 people have died so far in the last five years because of the civil war that's occurring. It is also out of that Syrian nation that ISIS was born. And so we've heard about ISIS a lot in the news, and it's been in our forefront for these last five years. Refugees have been scattered everywhere, and people have been killed throughout the nation of Syria. According to the bishop of the Assyrian church, over 15,000 Assyrian church families remaining in Syria are at risk in the continuing crisis. So there is a very real present danger. There is a group of believers in Syria, and they are extremely much under attack. 
despite these threats to Christians, there are still many who are brave enough to proclaim God's word and invite followers into church. A team of about 10 church planters in Syria were allowed to choose between leaving the country or continuing risking their lives to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The 10 church planters decided they would stay. They were not going to leave. Their mission was too important. They also recruited 15 other Christian church leaders as well, and now there are 25 church planters standing together in the nation of Syria, right in the middle of ISIS territory, Islamic country. One of the planners made this quote, we're ready to stay, we're ready to suffer, we're ready to die here in Syria for Jesus. This, to seal this commitment, they bought a plot of land, and they said they had this land, so if one member died, the others could bury them on this piece of property. But they were committed to the spread of the gospel. As of now, the graveyard is still empty, praise the Lord. There's no one been shot or killed or buried there. Persecution. We read about it in other countries, in other nations, in other lands. We know that the threat is very real, that believers every day, there have been more martyrs in the last decade than at any other time in the history of our world for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've got to ask ourselves the question, why are Christians being persecuted all throughout history and now especially in this day and age in which we live? And why in America, and let's just bring it down to where we live, why is it politically correct to talk about every group that is out there but to talk about Christians or the Bible or Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life? And why is everybody so upset about Christianity? <coughs> At the root of the problem is the sinful nature. There is a sin nature. And when we're confronted with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it smacks against our sin nature. And we don't want anyone to tell us what to do or come under any moral guidelines or, or be reminded uh, that God is still on his throne. And so the nations laugh and they scoff against God and they fight against the people of God. And God has already won the victory, but he keeps going after the seed, which is the church of the living God today. Jesus made this statement. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. They hated me first. And yet somehow we get so surprised. Someone says something about us. Someone writes something on Facebook about us. Someone persecutes us on the job. Someone says something in the high schools. Someone ridicules the children of God. And we seem blown away by this. Jesus said, hey, don't let this freak you out and surprise you. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. Because we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christians are made in the likeness and in the image of God. So we remind the devil of the one who 2,000 years ago beat him up on the cross. And the Bible says he even crushed the head of the serpent. Jesus Christ did that when he was crucified. Left to ourselves, we want to be our own gods. We want to be in charge. He says we throw off all restraints. We throw off our fetters. We don't want anyone telling us what to do. Psalm chapter 2, verse 2. We come against the Lord. Biblical Christianity invokes violent responses from some people because only in Christianity is there an absolute right and wrong. Now, here's the, here's the rub. Here's the situation. When a world tells you, you can do whatever you want to, there's no right or wrongs. There's no right way to follow. Everybody can find their own way to God. When we stand up and begin to declare, yes, there is a right and wrong, that Jesus Christ is the only way, he is the only truth, he is the only life, right away that comes up against this world's philosophy. And so the world kicks back, and the world attacks, and the world persecutes, just like they did Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Jonathan Edwards made this statement, natural men are enemies to God's dominion. And their nature shows their goodwill to, de to dethrone him if they could. Their heart says, let the world be empty of a God, for he stands in my way. Now there's a couple of things we need to understand in this conflict we find ourselves into today. And the first is simply this, you will face persecution. 
what's going to happen. Let's not be surprised about what's going on in America and what's going on in our own environments today. Turn to John chapter 15. I want to share some scripture with you today. John 15, look if you would at verse number 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to this world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words that I spoke to you, no servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. The spirit of this world has always been an enemy of the righteousness of God and been a violent persecutor of the Lord's anointed. So always gone after the church, always gone after the believer, the child of God. So we shouldn't be surprised, the Bible says, when we face opposition. He says in Matthew 5, 10, Jesus said that we're blessed if we're persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted. And then it goes on to say, for righteousness sake. Now let me just pause for a moment to say this. If you're being persecuted because you're a jerk, that's different than being persecuted for righteousness sake. If you're being persecuted because you're a bully or you're angry or you're lashing out or you're returning in kind or you've got a self-righteousness that says I'm better than you, well then you deserve it. It's going to come. But there's a different kind of persecution, and that's a persecution for righteousness' sake. It just simply means when I take a stand for Jesus Christ, and I do the right thing, and I identify as a Christ follower, you can expect some persecution to come along, because that in itself is an affront to their lifestyle. They want to live how they want to live, and just the fact that you are living a holy life in front of them, you will draw criticism and attack, and I will tell you, if you blow it, there's going to be, they're going to jump all over you, and they're going to say, hey, and you call yourself a Christian, and you did this, and you said that, and you responded this way, because they're watching. They want to see if it's real. They want to see if it's genuine, and so you will be attacked, and you will be falsely accused. Now, the bottom line is, We have no righteousness in ourselves. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. It means absolutely nothing. It is no good whatsoever. Apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, we are all guilty. We are all without hope. But when we find Christ, the Bible says, I am robed in his righteousness, and I am made and remade in the image of God. And so I wear his armor and his robes and his clothes. And so he said, if they accused me and they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The test for a a disciple or a Christ follower is not if you will be persecuted, but let me take it one step further, how you respond to that persecution. So the question is for us, when it comes and when it happens, Jesus said it will happen, you will be persecuted How do we respond? How how do we react? What do we say in the face of persecution? Turn to Matthew chapter 5, and I want you to get this this morning. Matthew 5 and verse 43. You have heard that it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his rain, his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So he says, love those who persecute you. Now that's, that's the real rub, and that's the challenge today. He goes on to say, anybody can love those who love you. Even pagans do that, he says in the word of God. But when you as a child of God respond by showing love in return instead of violence in return or anger in return, which we've seen a lot of this last week, if we respond with love even in the midst of all that is going on, it is a powerful statement for the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a way of lifting up Jesus Christ. And he says, when you do that, I will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ, he's been beaten They put him on a cross. He's hanging there. 
one of the seven last statements he made was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want to tell you, that's a test if we're a son of the Father or not. Can we forgive somebody who's hurt us? Can we forgive somebody who's talked about us? Can we pray for those who persecute us? Stephen was a lot like Jesus Christ. They're stoning him to death. And he says in Acts 7, 60, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. It's easy to love those who love you in return, but it's an entirely different matter altogether to love those who persecute you. And you can't do this on your own. You need the supernatural help and strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we love in that way, when that love is constantly being shown, even to those who've spoken about us or gossiped about us or talked about us, what happens is we are in some way exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's he say? If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And what's going to draw the world to Christ is our love, not retaliation and anger and wrath. It's not enough to be right even though I know I'm right based on God's word, even though I believe I'm right and there is a holy and just standard, that's not enough. It's also got to be accompanied with love. Otherwise, our words mean nothing. You've got to let the light of Christ shine through you. There have always been those who oppose God's plan and purposes, who plot against the Lord and his anointed, as it says in Psalm 2. But history shows us and the word of God teaches us that the gospel of Jesus Christ is unstoppable. You can't stop the spread of the gospel. In fact, the more they try to stamp out the gospel, the more the church has been persecuted through all the generations, the more the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads. And so I take you back to Psalm chapter 2. I want you to read the response. I, I started with why do the nations plot against the Lord? Why do their rulers try to usurp his authority? Let's pick it up with verse number four. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger, terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, on my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possessions. You will rule over them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. The Bible says all the attempts to stamp out Christianity, all those rulers and nations who align themselves up against God, he says, what is God's response? He laughs. Because you can't stop God. He's an unstoppable God. And our gospel is an unstoppable gospel. He laughs at all attempts to silence the church. We can write resolutions. No more praying in school. No more praying in the White House. No more praying here or there. No more witnessing in the schools. No more Bible studies will meet. No more classes can come together and talk about Jesus Christ. And and we look and we, we say, oh, what a bad shape America's in. But the Bible says, you know what? God is laughing the whole time because when the true church will rise up and speak out, they cannot stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's laughing because the spread of the gospel cannot be stopped. It will literally reach every nation to the ends of the earth. The Pharisees and Sadducees plotted against God and the word of God because they thought if they kill and crucify Jesus Christ, they'll stop it once and for all and no one will follow him anymore. But Peter and John get full of the Holy Spirit and those other disciples and they preach on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people are saved 50 days after Jesus Christ is crucified. And they they, they, they get Peter, they get John, they take a, a, a whip and they beat them and flog them mercilessly. They drag him before the Sanhedrin and they say, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. And they say, full of the Holy Spirit, and they look him right back in the eyes, we can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. And the gospel continued to spread, and the church grew. And you read the book of Acts, and there's 3,000 saved. Then 5,000 added to the church. And then it says, and then the number multiplied. 
They send Saul of Tarsus to Damascus with papers to lock up believers and stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on the way, a glory of God comes down and his life is changed. And everywhere he would go from city to city to city, proclaiming the love and gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would try to stir up riots. They would come against Paul. He was imprisoned. He is beaten. He is shipwrecked. He goes through all kinds of persecution. But the gospel just keeps spreading all throughout the Roman Empire until finally in 313, uh, uh, Constantine says Christianity will be the official religion of Rome. And it spread so much. Persecution after persecution, ten waves of persecution from the hands of the Romans, uh, but they could not stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is said that for everyone who was martyred or killed or thrown to the lions or, or burned at the stakes or torn in two, two more would rise up to take their place. You can't stop the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says every attempt to try to stop it, it says God sits in heaven and he laughs scoffs at the nations in their attempts to stop the spirit and presence of God. No stopping it. Despite some problems in the early church, the death of Ananias and Sapphira, the stoning of Stephen, imprisonments, shipwrecks, riots, every kind of opposition, they could do nothing to stop the spread of the gospel. I got a prayer request that came this week. And I just wanted to share part of it with you, and I wanted to share the conclusion of it as well. And so it says, in June 24th, the upper and lower houses of the Russian parliament voted to pass legislation against terrorism and extremism because they're having so much trouble in Russia. But lumped in with all those, they're also lumping in the church or the Christians. And so they have passed a rule and legislation that nobody can speak about Jesus on the streets. His name cannot be brought up except in the legalized, authorized churches. There can be no more house church meetings, no more believers coming together, no more talking about Jesus Christ anymore across the nation of Russia. And so they've asked the church to gather together and pray because it's all becoming before Putin this week and he's got to decide whether he's going to veto this or allow the legislation to pass through. But I like what it says at the end of the article. It says, if it goes through, however, we know the gospel advancement will not cease. If the president signs this law, pray the Holy Spirit will give the wisdom to the believers concerning how to continue to evangelize despite the opposition. Finally, pray the church in Russia continues to passionately proclaim Jesus no matter what happens. No government law can defeat his kingdom. Amen? So we're going to pray for Russia, we're going to pray for that church, we're going to pray for the spread of the gospel. But even if he lets the law go through, it's not going to stop the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the revolution took place in communist China, and the communist revolution took place, all missionaries were forced out of the nation of China. And the persecution, thousands upon thousands of believers in China were killed, and they tried to stamp out the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the areas where the persecution was the very hardest during the Cultural Revolution, right now we are seeing the greatest harvest of souls we've ever seen in the nation of China in the most persecuted areas. It just shows you can't stop the gospel. It is unstoppable. Nations and organizations and individuals continue to plot against the Lord. And maybe even against you. Maybe you face some opposition in your witness in your light, and your testimony. Some individuals are just getting in your face and you've seen them get angry and turn red in the face and say, don't talk about Jesus anymore. And they almost hiss at you like a snake or a serpent trying to get you to back down and not talk about Jesus anymore. What should our response be when this happens? Rejoice and be glad. He says, when you are rejoice when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. If God is in heaven laughing when all that is going on, we need to, as church and his children, learn to laugh with the Lord Jesus Christ and say, you know what, no matter what happens, God, you're still on your throne, you're still in control, the gospels continue to go forth. And when the more the persecution comes, or the darker it may seem to get in America, it is the greatest opportunity for the light of the church to shine brighter. 
In fact, every time the enemy sends or is behind the persecution, it's kind of like the proverbial, he shoots himself in the foot because the church only bands together, draws together, and gets stronger in their light, their witness, and in their testimony. Rejoice. Christ said, if I be lifted up, regardless of what opposition might be out there, regardless of the persecution, I will draw all men unto me. And so I rejoice and I pray for those who despitefully use me and I let my light shine brightly and I love those who come against the church or against me or anybody else. In the Old Testament, Israel had gotten far from God. So as a result, he allows Judah and Jerusalem to be taken into captivity. They're carried off into the land of Babylon, wicked, idolatrous nation. And, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar had a way of finding the best and the brightest. And you read about it in the book of Daniel. And, he, and three of them are three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and Nebuchadnezzar is a maniacal, self-centered, proud, egotistical king. And he says, I'm going to build a statue. And he builds this statue, not in private. I mean, it's going on for a long time. To build a 90-foot statue is going to take many, many months to do by hand. And so the whole nation watches this statue being built up 90 feet in the air. He says, when the band strikes up, when the music strikes up, I want everybody to bow down in front of that statue in worship of that idol and in worship of me as the king of Babylon. So you can imagine when it came time for that day, they'd announced it many days in advance, and the music starts to play, and everybody begins to bow down, and once all across that nation, three people are left standing. And it's not hard to pick them out. They're the only ones on their feet. And they stand out like sore thumbs. And everybody sees exactly who they are. And Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible says, blows his cork. He gets so angry that three men would defy him in open public. And he brings them before him, and, and it says this. He says, furious with rage, furious with rage, Daniel 3 and 13, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he basically gives them another chance. He says, if you don't bow down right now, I've got a furnace of fire. I'm going to throw you guys in that fiery furnace, and you'll die right there, and it'll be over and he says, you know what, if, if we perish, we perish, and if we live, we live, but we're not going to bow down to your gods. And I want to tell you, that's what America needs to see today. If we perish, we perish, we're not bowing down before the gods of this world, people who will stand for holiness and righteousness no matter what the consequences may be. Now, now Nebuchadnezzar kind of goes out of his mind for just a moment. He says, you know what, if you don't bow down, guys, I want you to crank the fire up seven times hotter. Now, now think about the logic of that. If you crank the furnace up seven times higher, and his whole idea is to inflict pain on those who defied him, they're simply going to die faster. And so there's going to be less pain, they're going to die faster. But how many know when people get angry or mad or fill with rage, they lose their brains. They don't work very well, and they lose their minds, and they react compulsively. And this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar does. And so he gets so mad, he does something that doesn't make sense. But while he's doing all this, what does Psalm 2 tell us? While the nations are raging against God, God is in heaven laughing. And he's laughing in heaven of what they're trying to do to stop the gospel of Jesus, to stop the gospel of God, or the proclamation of the one true Jehovah God. And they throw the guys in the fiery furnace, and when they look, they're in there moving around. Uh, I don't know what they're doing, but he says there's a fourth in there, and he looks just like the Son of God. I don't know exactly what they did in that fiery furnace, but I believe they're laughing together. And so what am I saying? When the world comes against you, when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, what do we do? We respond like God does in Psalm 2. We laugh with the Lord. Because we know the gospel is going to keep moving out in power. And the darker the world may get, the more our light can shine. And so they laugh together. So what do we do? How do we respond? How do we live our life when this inevitable persecution comes? I want to give you three things real quick. Jot these down. Number one, be your own person. 
Don't try to be anybody else. Be yourself. Be your own person. Do what is right. Believe what is true, regardless of what everybody else might be doing. And that leads me to my second point. It's simply this. Be more concerned about what God thinks than what others think. We are so influenced by popular opinion. We want to be liked by everything. We read our own clippings on Facebook or on wherever it may be, Twitter, tweet, what, whatever's out there. And we're so concerned about what people might think about us that if we're not careful, we'll bend in different areas of society to fit in. But the bottom line is the only opinion that really matters is what God thinks. I want to stand for him and live for him and love him and let that show. And so don't do maybe the most popular thing, do the right thing. Those who waffle back and forth in their opinions, trying to please man, they ultimately don't love themselves or respect themselves. And so to do what God thinks. And number three, stand your ground. Stand your ground. Don't bow down. Some people are intent on denying Christians their religious freedoms. I want to tell you there is still one freedom in America we need to hang on to, and that's the freedom of speech. And as far as I know, the last thing I saw, it's still in the Constitution. They still can't take that freedom away from us. It's still there. So use that freedom we have in America to speak out. Know your rights as children of God and speak out for faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's happening in America? Well, I think the enemy, and the reason I went to that story of, of Nebuchadnezzar, is I think the enemy is trying to turn up the heat in America. And it's going to get hotter. And he's going to stoke the fire of persecution, of public opinion, of calling the church bigots and narrow-minded and we're closed-minded and we're, we're out of touch and we'll hear all those kind of things and they'll accuse us of being hate mongers. What we're going to do is we're going to love. And we're going to love more than we've ever loved before. And he's going to turn the heat up hotter. He's going to turn the heat up hotter. But what's going to happen is the enemy's turning the heat up so hot in America, I believe we're going to see something. Churches begin to come together. Uh, races coming together. People coming together declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and just like every... All throughout history, the, the church is going to rally and persecution is going to fuel the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will be the seeds or the catalyst that will spark a revival in America today. And so while the enemy tries to turn up the heat, he's only going to shoot himself in the foot and the revival fires are going to kick in and spread across this land. I believe it's going to happen. I believe we are living in the last days and men and women are going to have to make a choice Choose this day who you will serve. Now I want us to stand together and we're going to pray for our land. We're going to pray for America today. We're going to believe God that God is going to move in a mighty, powerful way. Hallelujah. I, I want to, while you're standing, let me just share some headlines to you. And you've seen them if you've watched the news, unless you've had your head in the ground these last four or five days. Tuesday, July the 5th. Outrage, headlines right out of the news. Outrage after video captures white Baton Rouge police officer fatally shooting a black man. The next day, July the 6th, fatal shooting in Minnesota sparks protest across our country. And so groups begin to protest all across America, in our cities, against this police brutality, which according to the videos and what I saw was Brutal and uncalled for. The next day, Dallas police ambush. Twelve officers shot, five killed during the protest. Thursday, July the 7th. White shooting blacks, blacks shooting whites, a nation divided, choosing sides, protesting, hating, Stirring up the hate, stirring up the rhetoric. How does the church respond in these kind of times? With love and prayer. We pray for them and we love them and we care about our land and we care about people all around us. None of it's right. There's no explanation. 
ISIS, a man claiming to be with ISIS, less than a month ago on June 12th, walks into Orlando nightclub and guns down 49 people in cold blood. Shot, killed, others wounded. It's crazy. More and more we're hearing about terrorism and ISIS and where we're headed and what's going to happen in America. So we have the, the, the black and white thing going on and we have the threat of terror going on and, and there's so much hate speech out there. This is the time for the church to rise up and say there is a better way, that God loves us and we love one another and that we're going to pray for our nation and we're going to pray for America and we're going to pray for healing and we're going to pray that God will heal our land. Because the darker it gets, it's the more that people realize that their drugs and their partying and their violence and those things are not the answer. It will never ful fulfill the need inside of me. I need Jesus. I need God in my life. I believe it's going to be the catalyst that's going to drive people to their knees. We begin to pray for this land and pray for this country and pray for what's going on all around us.